Hello, YouTube. Hello, Effect. How you doing? Hey, I'm good. How are you today? Uh, I'm doing really well. I'm excited to have you back on the podcast. And yeah, before thanks. we jump into it, I see we already have some chat out there in the audience. So thank you for throwing these in. Some of these questions are going to be great. I'll ask them as we go when it makes sense. But if you're out there watching live, please put your comments into the live chat so we can make them part of the show. And if you're watching later, thanks for coming by. And with that, let's kick it off. Ofek, welcome to Talk Python to Me. Thank you. Good to be here. It's been a long time, at least a week since you've been on the show. <laughs> <laughs> yep, just about a week. Welcome back. Uh, in that appearance, it was a big panel of many of us talking about Python packaging. Yeah. And you're the author of Hatch and Hatchling and a, a really interesting take on that tooling story. So I thought it'd be fun to go ahead and just dive into that in particular for this mm -hmm. episode and get your thoughts on it. So I'm looking forward to talking about Hatch. Yeah, sounds fun. Yeah, it will be fun. Before we get into it, though, you know, a lot of people maybe don't know you out there. Uh, what's what's your background? How did you get into programming in Python? Those sorts of things. Let us, let us know. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I guess originally, uh, this is like maybe 15 years ago now, um, I was just automating stuff that I was doing every day. Um, so for me personally, I have a condition that makes me kind of weak. So all I can use is like a mouse. Uh, therefore, I type pretty slow. So um, I was auto-completing like sentences, um, templating for like sending emails, uh, basically like the traditional developer mindset. If you do anything more than once or twice, just write a script for it. So I had like uh, dozens or maybe even a hundred scripts just to automate like boring stuff. Kind of like mm -hmm. the book, which I've never yeah. read the book, Automate the Boring Stuff, but <laughs> I imagine it's what I was doing. That's how I originally got into Python. Yeah. Excellent. You were doing the uh, traditional developer thing. Why spend 20 minutes doing something when you can spend two weeks automating it? Yeah. <laughs> no, just, just kidding. Like, exactly. I, honestly, yeah. I, I really think that that's a, a huge value. There's, there's so many people out there, probably many people even listening to this podcast, where they don't consider themselves developers, but there's like little things that could be automated that are mm -hmm. super annoying. <laughs> Uh, you don't look forward to it, right? It, just a little bit of programming skill will let you really blaze through those things. Plus, it also Definitely. gets you further into Python, where you know maybe one day you're releasing tools to manage everyone else's Python projects. Yep, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> you don't know where it's going to go, right? Yep, and uh, yeah, now I work at uh, Datadog, um, working on agent integrations. So it's like the thing that you physically install on your server or host, it ships out of the box with like almost 200 integrations, like connecting to uh, databases like Postgres um, or monitoring like Windows APIs um, or hypervisors like vSphere, pretty much whatever you know, our customers want to monitor. It's our job to like find a way to connect to it and provide useful data. So. Yeah, excellent. A, a lot of research into um, every product that we integrate with. Sometimes the documentation is kind of sparse, so it's lots of uh, investigative work. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. That sounds really fun. And I can see that as a follow-on from the way you got started as well, right? Automating a bunch of tasks is not that different from kind of automating integration with 100 different apps and performance yeah. counters and logs yeah. and yeah. different things, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Is that part of the application performance monitoring type thing? Or there? Uh, the uh, we do that as well. Hand? That's not my team, but yeah. Um, okay. That's part of what we do. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, let's go ahead and dive in. Sure. So as I said, if people want to check it out. You were on the Python packaging discussion. And over there was a, a broad conversation with a bunch of core developers and other interested folks building tools like Hat and so on about where are we with packaging? Because a little while ago, I remember packaging mostly felt like PIP instead of tools, maybe just, just utils, something like that. Mm -hmm. 
and then it kind of got unlocked this the separation of like the build back ends and stuff and then many people started creating things we had pip env we have poetry um we have pdm there's a bunch of different ones uh and hatch is amongst them right yeah 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 so let's let's set the stage by just talking about well first of all what do we mean when we're talking about python packaging and, and i'll ask you for you right like it might yeah. mean something different for me then it might mean for for you and it might be different for someone else as well but let's just start with you know it, when we talk packaging is that getting libraries to devs is that developers deploying their apps to servers or is that me sending a, an executable end product to a desktop like what does it mean yeah no, that's a good question i i would say all of those are packaging uh historically though um we've mostly uh, put our efforts toward the first one, which is basically like a developer making a library and making that really simple uh, for other developers to use that library. Mm -hmm. So in the form of wheels being hosted on PyPI in particular, that's what we put our efforts on, which I think um, either way you look at it was the right choice to focus on uh, in the beginning. Because like either, either way, like from either first principles or even hindsight, looking back, you can't build a community without packages and being able to get packages and distribute packages. So I think that was uh, the right choice. And I think now we're trying to satisfy other use cases, um, notably um, applications, I guess. Yeah. Oh, I mean, we even have an XKCD for it, right? True. <laughs> and I don't know how many people know this. If you're in the Python REPL, you can type import anti-gravity. And actually, <laughs> it does something. So the old XKCD is yeah. there's a person flying, and the a person on the ground looks at us. How are you flying? Python. Just learned it last night. <laughs> Everything's so simple. Hello world is just print. Hello world. The person on the ground says, I don't know. Dynamic typing, white space. Come on, join us. Programming's fun again. <laughs> Okay, but how are you flying? I just typed import anti-gravity, <laughs> right? And it's a great <laughs> joke. But honestly, that is one of those superpowers of Python is that, yeah. I don't know, how, how many things do we have right now? Uh, how many packages? 436,000 packages. Like, insane. Yep. It's just insane. Yeah, no, it's a yeah, massive community. Um, and really all kinds of domains from doing, you know, as we talked about automating scripts, you know, different tasks, uh, to doing like uh, computing for uh, whether, you know, biomedical stuff, um, mm -hmm. you know, even de uh, embedded devices now with like uh, MicroPython, stuff like that. So it's, yeah, users of Python do everything pretty much. Yeah, I'm, I think in the near term, we're going to be talking about front end web as well with. Yes. PyScript. PyScript showed the possibilities, but I recently had a show on PyScript intersection with MicroPython, and that, that starts to be like, well, here's a couple hundred K download, and now you got Python on the front end. What do you think about it now? But of course, that has its own packaging and distribution uh -huh. story that we're going to have to think about as well. Like, well, kind of like node modules. Now, what do you do with packages that got to run on the front end? This is getting weird. Yeah, and yeah, that, that kind of goes to, you know, talking about, like, how hard it is to do packaging when you have, you know, dozens of use cases that we have yeah. to satisfy. And with us being mostly just volunteers in our free time trying to do everything. So, yeah, it's, yeah. it's fun and also challenging. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Another area, another thing we could consider could be Conda. Right, actually, yeah, I got that below over here. Could be Conda, right? This is a, a completely different take on on Pip and Wheels. Yeah, yeah, Conda is pretty cool. I think Conda, uh, if I have my history right, it came about because there really was no packaging story mm -hmm. um, some time ago. So Conda, I think, was made by Peter Yang, if I remember correctly, um, and he has a whole company now around it, supporting Conda. Um, and yeah, it just makes it uh, easy to install, 
very complex stuff. So if your package depends on, yeah, you could you can uh, put in Fortran and Rust and all kinds of stuff, and it just magically builds it, and you can install it pretty easily. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, it's pretty impressive. It, it is pretty impressive, and you know, with Wheels now, it's closer. What we do with Pip, it uh -huh. used to be setup.py would run and whatever it needed to do it would do but often that would require well compile this usually with c back then but uh -huh. for the scientific libraries it says well compile this thing with fortran and they compile <laughs> this thing with scala you're like i have neither of those things set up to, as dev tools on my environment i'm a, a science student what am i doing here right yeah. and so that was that was the angle they were solving and i think Pip and Conda are coming a little bit closer together. I think they're not yeah. necessarily converging, but they're they have they're more similar now than they used to be. Yeah, definitely that, that is true. And yeah, there is talk. Uh, I don't know how many people are aware, but the Python forums has a a subsection on discourse for packaging. So yeah, right now uh, from people at Conda trying to how trying to decide how we can kind of provide a more like a unified experience because okay, right now conda has their own repo like for all their packages and PyPI is its own thing outside of conda so yeah there's talk about possibly making that like uh like interoperable oh yeah okay that'd be really interesting uh, let's see there was a question out here uh from copa since sort of in this realm like what do you think about docker as a way of shipping things, uh, you know, a lot of times we'll get checkout, get clone some code on a server, maybe some production mm -hmm. branch, and then go through these steps, right? Pip install requirements or the hatch run type of initialization. Um, or you just get that done in a Docker container and you just hand that out. What, what are your thoughts on Docker as part of this? Yeah, yeah Docker definitely has its use cases. Um... Like, I guess in lieu of the lock file, you could kind of use Docker as a reproducible, uh, you know, environment. Um, but I still think there's a place for a way to actually build applications and, um, you know, outside of Docker, outside of containers in a reproducible fashion. I think that's still necessary. I do as well. I need, so Docker really... Uh, it addresses some of the types of packaging that we discussed really, really well. For example, uh -huh. I need to get my running code onto a server, but Docker is less good. It's not completely irrelevant, but it's less good at giving a developer a library, right? If yeah. the people that make HTTPX and the people that make fast API, they're not going to build a, a combo Docker, thing, right? There's still a place where you've just got to get the things and that's like a, a base level closer to where a hatch might be working and also docker is not fantastic at sending to an end user if i want to build an app that a non-technical non-developer person can use docker is the opposite of what they want <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah true yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah i will say there's another use case which is like if your machine is like messed up somehow and some, some library package isn't working i've had this happen with like coworkers on the Macs, it is nice to be able to just go into the container and start fresh. So I've had yeah. that happen a few times. Yeah, it it is isolated in quite a good way, and that's that's pretty yeah. pretty excellent. So on that uh, packaging panel that we were on, there was a really interesting cons uh, focus uh, for a little bit talking about well, what is responsible for what so right now for example i might use pip as a way to add tools to python to a python project but i have to already have python there and in other communities um, and even a little bit like conda in, in this as well there's tools that will say what you do is use a tool kind of like pip but it gets you the runtime it gets it would get you a version of python you asked for plus the libraries you know um i think yeah. rust up was one of the the things that was brought up there right uh -huh. <clears throat> so for people who don't know rust up it's an installer for system for 
basically setting up a Rust environment for doing Rust. So pip up, <laughs> Python up, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what we would call it. But do you want to just, you know, maybe give your thoughts on that? Because I, I think you have yeah. some comments on that, like inside out, outside in, where, where, if you could start fresh, <laughs> where were the tools? Uh, how would that work? Yeah, I think if we were to start fresh, um, I think the way Rust does it is like now the, the gold standard. It's probably the best way to do it, which is how, um, I, as you mentioned, Conda, that's a similar thing, where you have a tool that you download, and that one tool is in charge of managing the various Py like Python or programming language versions. So if I were to start fresh, you would have a tool like Catch that you would download uh, you know, as an MSI or EXE or some kind of installer, similar to RustUp. And then that tool would manage the various uh, Python versions and environments and packaging. Um, so for RustUp, uh, when you download this, it gives you RustUp, which manages Rust, but then it gives you Cargo, which is a separate command, and that's their package manager. Right. But in both Car cases, they live outside of Python. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, Cargo is is to Rust as pip is to Python, right? That, that right, thing. right. Yeah. Okay, so that I think that's pretty helpful because one of the problems is, well, you need to pip install this thing. Oh, do you have the wrong version of Python? Well, you got to, you know, you, there's a lot of steps back and there's no immediately obvious command other than in completely from scratch install a new Python. Yeah. There's, other, there's the tools that manage that, right? Like Pi ENV can work, although I've had trouble with it. Yeah, I've had issues with that. Yeah, I, I think um, it would be less error prone in this hypothetical way where the tool uh, doesn't mess with your you know, uh, show in a global manner. It just uh, has its own paths to Python and just does everything uh, by itself. That's interesting. Yeah. And that starts to maybe make it easier to solve the, I want to ship you an a executable binary, is if the tool <laughs> were in charge of, I create this working directory where part of the, the things I've installed is all of Python and all the, the packages you've asked me for, I can see how that pretty quickly becomes something I'll bundle that up and hand it to somebody and, you know, give them an entry point. Yeah, definitely. I could um, help that situation. Uh, I think there's not really a, a standard way to build an exe from like a Python package. There are a few tools that like um, PyOxidizer is one newer mm -hmm. option. Uh, PyInstaller, um, CXFreeze, I think was the thing yeah. that I've used before. So I've used there's Pi a few options. App. Yeah, I've used Py the app, and that's actually worked really well. Mm -hmm. I've used Py installer and it's worked mostly well, except for I've had weird situations where on Windows it's great, but on Mac it has a dangling terminal in, in addition to the GUI. I'm like, oh, uh. what are we supposed to do with that? How do we make it go away? Like, <laughs> you know, here's the command. Like, no, it's not going away. I don't know why. And if there was a, a more official sort of core dev organized way, uh, that would make me super happy. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not so much like for, official or unofficial like my view is like if it works it, it works so as yeah. long as it's satisfying you know all the use cases that's what i would push for so i think right now based on what i've used personally i think pyoxidizer would be the best choice for distributing uh standalone apps interesting okay all right cool well let's uh, move on and start talking about hatch so sure. first off Why'd you build it, right? We had we had pip. <laughs> <laughs> why, yeah. why do we need hatch? And, and you know, I don't know exactly the time frame of when it came out. So you, maybe we had other things like poetry, or you know, why did you go and create this? So hatch, I did. It was kind of an older project um, back in uh, the end of 2016 or early 2017. Um, I wasn't pleased with like the tooling and. Python, I think very similar to the author of poetry. Uh, that's kind of why he made poetry. Um, so I wanted something that kind of matched my mental model of how development would go with building packages and 
managing environments automatically, stuff like that. Um, when I made it, though, there weren't very many standards for packaging, and everything was kind of in limbo at that point, which kind of discouraged me from continuing, because then I was like, okay, in a six months or a year or two, I'm going to have to rewrite to follow standards. So I kind of just stopped development for a few years until everything was standardized. And then I rewrote it about a year and a half ago uh, with this new version and new docs. So that's kind of the history of it. Yeah, Yeah, I saw that there's a hash.toml and a pyproject.toml, and you can use either of them. Was your yeah. hatch.toml the original and then pyproject.toml gained traction? And you're like, all right, well, well, we'll integrate with that as well? No, hatch came, um, hatch.toml came with the rewrite. It's okay. mostly for environments. Sometimes when you define lots of environments, it's very verbose. Um, like I, at my workplace, I saw a talk like over a thousand lines. So oh. <laughs> putting that in pyproject wouldn't be very nice. So that's why I have a second file. To isolate uh, certain yeah, 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 it makes sense. Like, just like maybe you don't want to write your entire application in an app.py, but maybe right. have multiple yeah. files. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> All right. Well, out in the audience, we've got some uh, kind words. Like I switched to Hatch and Pip Tools from Poetry and love it. That's, that's nice. pretty awesome. Yeah. And then uh, probably before I'll forget, because it was right at the top of the conversation, uh, Marwan asks... Um, is there a time estimate for when a hatch uh, might support things like lock files? That's a good question. Uh, so my, my goal is by PyCon to write the plugin interface for locking. Um, so the first version, uh, we use pip tools, actually. That would be the first plugin for lock files. Um, but I won't be writing like an actual lock file spec. I'll just be using an existing tool. Um, but the, the, the new hypothetical lock file is kind of blocked on Brett because he has most context. In the... So, yeah, I'm waiting on Brett, basically. Got it. Brett Cannon. That'd be in Brett Cannon. Yes. Uh, yeah. Python developer extraordinaire, we all know. Um, okay, very cool. Other thing before we dive into it here, I see that you have uh, some rough action going there. I just had Charlie on the show uh, not not too long ago to talk about rough. It's it's pretty impressive. When did you adopt that? Uh, I was an early adopter. Um, I guess a few months ago now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What's yeah, your it's, experience? Uh, it's fantastic. It's um, it's kind of like a, a meme to say it now, but it's true. Like it's so fast, it's almost like you wonder if it's doing anything. Like yeah, that's <laughs> that was my first thought when I ran it. I'm like, wait yeah. a minute, maybe I didn't give it any files or something because I ran it on Talk Python Training, which is like, you know, twenty thousand lines of Python code, and it just it just went yeah. bam like that. I'm like, maybe it didn't take that because that seems like that should take a moment at least. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so it's now, very yeah. great. Okay, yeah, so yeah, I like having a big, yeah, all on kind of one location and. Uh, it supports like so many options as well, which is nice. Yeah, indeed. Cool, cool. All right. Well, let's let's start with a high level overview. And then what I want to do is I want to walk mm-hmm. through creating a project with this. And I've got questions and and thoughts as I kind of experience Hatch sure. not for the first time, but for a somewhat of a newbie perspective. So I think we'll we'll do that. But let's start with the high level features. Um, Okay. Yeah. So I guess the first um I would just go you know point by point. Yeah. Uh, so the build system so the hatch project is I guess conceptually two different projects. Uh hatch itself is the command line. So doing uh publishing and environment management, versioning, stuff like that. Then the hatch thing is the build system, similar to a uh, flit or set of tools. So that's what the build system is. Um, uh, from you can use it independently, right? You don't yes, have to be doing anything with Hatch to use Hatch Lean. Uh, basically, yeah, most people replace setup.py, right? Yeah, you can replace setup.py with the pyproject.toml. Yeah, 
and most people do use hatchling and not use hatch. So yeah, hatchling is much more popular than uh, hatch itself. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, so for a config, uh, it's a bit more um, simple than a set of tools. Um, the uh, default logic um, makes more sense for for new users, especially. It's hard to mess up uh, packaging with Hatchling. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. So I could have just some random Python project that I've put together with a pyproject.tom all I wrote by hand, and I yeah. could just put Hatchling in as the build subsystem to make the wheels and whatnot, right? Yeah, and uh, one benefit of Hatchling, I hatch too. Uh, basically, everything is a plugin. So you can have like a build hook that does like MyPyC, which we have. You can have a, a metadata hook where you insert like project um, URLs from some arbitrary location. Uh, pretty much everything you can plug into and, and modify. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. All right, and then a robust environment management. Uh, yeah, so for this, this you could think of as a as Tox or Nox, um, similar in spirit to that. The difference is um, Nox and Tox kind of um, treat environments as applications where an environment is tied to a command and you run an environment. Whereas in Hatch, you have environments that you define and then within that, you have scripts that you can run. So you can have a uh, style environment that might be able to lint with one script or run the formatter to change the code with another script. Uh, an environment itself isn't actually like like an app. You can Got it. run arbitrary commands. Right, like I could run hatch test or uh, uh -huh. something like that, yeah? And pass in flags, yeah. OK. And then. Often people who published packages to PyPI, uh -huh. they've done this with Twine or some tool like that. And Hatch has that capability as well, right? Right, yeah, to yeah, PyPI or some private, you know, corporate owned uh, index. Yeah. I think those are probably getting to be more popular than they yeah, used to be they are. with all the supply chain silliness. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any visibility into how people are using it, whether it's public or private? Or, um, like as far as Hatch, publishing? yeah. Well, how they're using Hatch to publish. Do you have any visibility whether they're publishing to PyPI or to some kind of private index? Um, based on the issues I have open, like feature requests, most are talking about private indices. Actually, interesting. Yeah. It's probably those are the ones where the edge cases live. <laughs> you know, the, true, the standard true. one place is dialed in. And well, what if mine's on using Active Directory for authentication as I publish it? Like, it's doing what? <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, uh, Artifactory is quite popular yeah. as well. Yeah, 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 that absolutely is. Another thing that was interesting is you have the ability to do version management, as we'll see in just a minute. You can say, like, what version is my package? Increment the build or do a major version increment or put it into a release candidate mode. Yeah. And this is pluggable as well. So there's one plugin that's popular that wraps um setup tools SCM. Um which doesn't actually depend on setup tools anymore. It's just in name it's still called that. So that pulls your version from Git or Mercurial or Subversion and you can source the versions. Uh, that way as well. Interesting. Yeah, I really like that. I think that's a, a neat aspect. Uh -huh. And then um, configurable project generation with same defaults. Yeah, I don't have too many options with this yet, but uh, you can make it a flat layout or like a source directory. Uh, there's no option to uh, add tests, which puts more stuff in your pyproject.pymol, you can add a CI, which has like a very simple um, template for GitHub actions. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a flag for a CLI that would give you a click 
and set up a command line for your package. I don't know how directly related this is to anything that Hatch does, but the usage of the pyproject.toml and then building it as a package, something you could install, gives you a really nice way to create a, a global CLI, right? With just the entry yeah. points in the pyproject.toml. Yeah, yeah, that's what that CLI flag does. Yeah, it's very Excellent. nice. Okay, yeah. Then also you say it's two to three times faster than equivalent tools. That's great. Yeah, it's um, it really just one trick. It just uh, I make the code not as readable by using lazy imports everywhere. I just put lazy imports, and that's why uh, it's faster. Okay. Yeah, because there's a lot of uh, execution paths that only use some of the imports in effect, yeah. right? Yeah. Cool. Uh, let's see. Going back to the scripts, Jonathan points out, I love the custom scripts within Hatch. It makes creating build pipelines way easier and moves most of the logic within the Hatch config rather than spreading them around multiple files, which is that's pretty cool. Nice. Yeah, that's what I do as well. Yeah. Yeah, cool. I even use Hatch for non Python projects just for the scripting ability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Well, I mean, Python traditionally had been used for a lot of that, you know, called it glue code, right? A lot of, mm -hmm. well, I really want to do these other things with these other systems and scripts, but let me kind of orchestrate that in Python. And that sounds a bit, uh, a bit like that. Yeah. Um, let's, let's do a little walkthrough. I think, I think that'll be fun. Sure. But first of all, I think this is just MK docs, but thank you for pointing it out that your uh, documentation and your website here have hotkeys. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, this is a uh, yeah, MK Docs with the material theme, which is very nice. Yeah, so it turns out if I just press a dot, it goes to the next page, and if I hit comma, it goes to the previous page. And yeah, it doesn't sound like much, but actually, it's really nice. It is really nice. Hey, before we leave the, this front page, one other thing to note to go back to the top, mm. just because I'm very happy with it, the logo was actually generated um, by Dolly. The AI. Uh, okay. Part. Yeah. Fantastic. So it, yeah, generate the logo, and then I had um, a brother of a friend from work, I like actually touch it up. So uh -huh. yeah. Oh, uh, it's a really cool logo. I like it. Um, I didn't catch on that it was made by Dolly, but now I yeah. see that. I've yeah, been doing a lot with Mid Journey, and I think these AI tools are. I think they're a little bit fraught with uh, maybe a few moral issues about like, well, <laughs> did you really train it on stuff that you were allowed to train on? But yeah. putting that aside, if they exist, you know, assuming just they exist, they're really neat. And there's really amazing stuff you can do with them. Yeah. 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 Cool. I guess uh, maybe a, a quick sidebar there is if you were a project maintainer out there and you don't really have an, a logo, drop in on Dolly or uh, Mid Journey and <laughs> spend half an hour and you probably will. Uh, but I, I just think there are so many people that build web apps out there that don't put hotkeys into them. And it's, it is not that hard and it is such a nice experience and it brings you so much closer to a native app type of experience. So please put, put some hotkeys out there for us. All right. So pressing dot takes to the first one. So installing hatch, obviously you can pip install it. Uh -huh. However, you offer some interesting other areas I want to talk about. First of all, my favorite, PipX. I love PipX. If you've got a, yeah. a tool that you don't directly import into your code that does stuff against your Python apps, boy, PipX is almost always a good choice. What do you think? Oh, yeah, PipX is awesome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it um, yeah, just allows you to um, you know, provide isolated apps you know, for command line apps. Yeah. I, I, yeah, it manages everything, and you don't even have to think about it. So yep. yeah, it just creates its own little environment, and you can say, upgrade all my installed CLI tools. It's like Package Manager if the thing that it's managing is built with Python. is great. I had Chad on the creator of PipX a while ago. So people, if they want to hear more about it, they can listen to that show. Homebrew, okay. good. Conda Brew, uh, Mac Ports is interesting. But the one that stood out to me was Mamba. I'm like, wait, what's Mamba? <laughs> yeah, I think it's a... Um... So, so there's a few. I hadn't heard of that, but yeah, yeah. The, I don't use Conda that much, but as far as I know, there's a few different distributions of Conda. So there's Anaconda, which gives you like a 
over a gigabyte installed, like massive scientific computing. There's Miniconda, and Miniconda mm -hmm. gives you just the bare minimum Conda CLI with like package management. Um, and that's what most people use, I think. But now there's Mamba, which is like Miniconda, <laughs> but it pulls from uh, Conda Forge by default. And Conda mm -hmm. Forge is sort of like our PyPI, where anybody can contribute their own packages. So I think that's the main difference. Um, and yeah, it is faster and it was rewritten. And that's what Mamba yeah. is. Yeah. It's a re implementation of Conda, the Conda package manager in C. Doing parallel downloading and other bits of that, which is interesting. Cool. Well, I don't use either all that much, but it's uh, still kind of cool to to see there. So you could Mamba install Hatch if that was your your workflow as well, right? Yeah. Okay, so installing it pretty easy. If you were to do it, if somebody gave you a blank machine and said, "Set this up to use Hatch," what would you do? For now, I would do. Pipex. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, in future, like we talked about in the beginning, I plan to have like an actual executable that does the work, um, like Python does. Mm. But until then, then probably pick up Pipex. Yeah. Okay. So maybe then it would be Homebrew and Winget and you know, yeah. yeah, things like the higher level OS ones. Okay. All right, so the way we get started is we just say hatch new. And I thought one of the things that I don't normally do here on the podcast, but I think it might be fun, is just to have kind of go through these steps here to uh -huh. see what it's like um, to, to get a sense, because um, then I can ask questions. So I'll say hatch new calc. I'll call my little app calc. And tell us about what we get when we run that. Sure. So it makes your package, uh, as you named it, with the about.py and an init.py. The init.py obviously makes it, turns that directory into a Python package. The about.py uh, stores the version by default, and that's where it, it reads it by default. Um, it gives you, oh yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, one of the things I can type now is hatch version, and it gives me, um, it gives me, basically pulls out the version of about.py, right? Yep. Yeah, and you can, if you do um, the same command again, but um, pass an arg, like, minor, then it can bump it as well. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. the old version is what it says, is 001. The new version is 010. Could I say build and get 11? Something like that. No, what would I type to change the last one? Uh, RC. You could do RC. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and uh, it, uh, it's documented the allowed uh, arguments as well. Got it. Um, sure. So yeah, then also give you a test directory that uh, doesn't have any predefined tests, but you can add tests to it. And then mm -hmm. the most important part is the pyproject.toml, which has your metadata and your other config. Right. So it's got the build system set to be hatchling, and uh -huh. then it's got all the project settings like who is the author, what are uh, what are the requirements. Uh, and all that stuff, right? Yep. And uh, from the author, it would have gotten that from Git. It, mm -hmm. The default comes from Git. So that's why it has the right stuff for you. Uh, and then down here right. is um, testing. So some coverage yeah. stuff and environments. When I, when I type patch new, could I have made it ask me those questions like who are you and stuff? There is an interactive mode, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah so you, you also, as part of this prior project.toml, you create some of these commands. These are the scripts you were talking about a little bit, right? Like yeah. you've got the test and other options you can run. Yeah, so this um, default example down there has an environment, which is just default, which is a little mm -hmm. bit special. It just means you have to add a, a prefix on the command line. And so there's two scripts by default. A cov, so you could do like a hatch run cov, and it will run pytest with coverage. And then another command is no cov. Yeah. yeah. Can I do hatch test, hatch run test? Is that a thing? Uh, there well? is no test command. You could do pytest. Okay. Mm. okay. So if you do hatch run pytest, you could, yeah. Okay. Yeah, excellent. That's really cool. 
Um, yeah, so it basically creates the structure for you and the workflow that we just discussed would be if I've got a, a folder and I want to start from absolute scratch, I want to create the entire directory structure through uh -huh. Hatch. But there's also a way I can go to an existing one and kind of convert it to Hatch or upgrade it to Hatch, right? Yes, which um, I've, me and other contributors have, have done it so much that most of the edge cases are gone. So it can take pretty much any setup.py uh, setup and turn it into a hatch uh, pi project at Um It's pretty good now. Okay, and because it doesn't it doesn't actually need hatch the CLI, the environment tool to do that to to run mm -hmm. and and build. You could just right. use that to get your pi project out and use hatchling as a build engine right but still yep. just keep going yeah yeah exactly yeah okay so people are sitting out there like i really w should be using pyproject.toml but you know inertia i don't really want to do it like uh, hatch new and knit might do it right yeah yeah that's an option before you time okay. out um if you do uh which python which maybe i can just illustrate um something hold on i gotta do that one there you go okay and now, and now if you do hatch run which Python 3, it will show you that it's actually in a managed virtual environment. Yeah, OK. So it's created a, a virtual environment over in, at least for me, app, library application support, hatch environments, and so on and yeah. so on, based on the project name. And then it has some big, long deal it's on just a hat, Yeah. It's yeah, just so, a checksum. OK, what is that a checksum based on? Like, oh, the reason I ask is, what do I change to make this no longer work? <laughs> what? what <laughs> Uh, so I, I do that because it's possible that somewhere else on your machine, you might have another project, maybe a fork of Kalki, uh, with the same name. So I have to likely, add it's a very popular yeah. library. So yeah. it's <laughs> likely. So that's that's why I do that. Yeah. I I see. Okay, that's like a hash of the path to where right, the project exactly. is. So, yep. Okay. So. A lot of projects, a lot of management tools work this way. Conda works this way, for example, where there's some other place where the virtual environments live. Is there a way, you know, a, another workflow that's pretty common is to have the virtual environment in a VNV folder at the root of the project. Is there a way when I create my project yeah. to say, I, I want a local ENV? Not at project creation time, but there is mm -hmm. a way in either hatch config or in pyproject.com, they're able to change that. Yeah. Is it, which okay. is documented on the site. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, yeah, the hatch config is, is one of the things I would I would do. There's a lot of cool uh, like CLI tools where you can ask it to like, show me the details of uh, whatever it is. So what would I put, say, into the config to say, create my VE and V locally? And, and call it what is it this ders v -E yeah ders env yeah, yeah env. What, what would i put in there oh uh, you have a sub table uh for virtual and then have the path be just dot them basically right okay so like a, a dot slash whatever you want to call it locally yeah can i is this um this i guess i could do hatch Find config or config find, I guess. Config, config find, find yeah. right? And that will, so this is, this is a global, like how do my projects get started using Hatch for my machine, not a per project deal, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. That's cool. So kind of like Git config. Once I set up my machine, if I say, well, I like my virtual environments like this, then I'll, yeah. I'll be okay, right? Yeah, it makes it easier to... Um... Distribute tooling, like for if you're managing like some corporate environment where you're using Hatch for everything, then it, it's nice to have a, a config that you can modify just mm -hmm. at the machine level. Then every project will do the same. Right. Behavior. Just as a team to say, look, we always want tests. We always want this other thing that we call it that. We always want this default library. Uh, sorry, we want this default license, right? We yeah. don't want MIT. We want, you know, corp dot ink or whatever license that we use. Uh -huh. 
So uh, a quick question from ZL out there that I think is relevant. Is this useful for application development, not libraries? Uh, I would if say I'm building is. like a Flask app or a fast API app, like would, would this be relevant? Yeah, so especially with the environment management, um, that's kind of what applications we use anyway. Uh, the missing feature, of course, like the other person asked, is the lock files. Um, for any app, you're going to want be, to be able to reproducibly build the app. So right now, there's not a way uh, built in other than using an environment with like pip tools or something. Um, so I, okay. I'm, I'm going to add that plugin interface soon. Yeah. Interesting. Does pip tools work with pyproject.toml? Do you know? It does now. Yeah, it does. Okay. Yeah, I've only used it with requirements.in and then generate the requirements.txt, but interesting. Yeah, they added that last summer, I think. Yeah. I'm so behind the times on this. <laughs> you know, these workflows, I, I, I'm sort of joking, but also not. These workflows, you kind of get into like, well, here's how I build these apps. Here's how I manage my requirements. And then you just, you know, tunnel. I think a lot of people just go, okay, well, that's working for me. I'm doing that. You know? I, yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. 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 Uh, and then, so if I want to, like, so for example, when I asked which Python, it said the one from Homebrew you've installed, silly. Of course, that's your global Python. If I want to activate a virtual environment, if I want to get into like this application mode, I would do yeah. a hatch shell, right? Yes. Uh huh. And because I have an awesome, oh my posh, you can see my prompt here is now taking on the Kalki 3.11.2 environment as part of my prompt. So uh, that's very cool. Uh, yeah, that's the one. So it, it's it's working now. If I ask just straight up which Python, it's a virtual environment one, right? Yeah. And I can do pip list and so on. But there's also ways I think I recall in Hatch to like show me my dependencies and get a list of. So how yeah, do I hatch do I uh dep show. Dep show. Yeah. Uh is it show dep? Table. Uh, uh table. It's just a few options, yeah. Yeah, okay. Select your environment. Yeah, so these I only have right now two dependencies, PyTest and PyTest Cov. Yeah. Interesting. Or I could do requirement. Yep, and I would spit out the same as um, the table, right? Just plain text. Yeah, just like requirements.txt. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah, excellent. Um, what do you recommend? So there's the hatch run commands, which will use the environment, or you can just go into the shell and run it. Or if I'm sneaky and I put my virtual environment in there, I might have something that automatically detects that environment and picks it up. So for example, PyCharm might go, you know what? I see a VE and V folder. We'll use that. And and just mm -hmm. grab it and not care about hatch directly, right? That's actually one of the reasons I was yeah. asking about putting it locally is it's kind of a hassle to find that thing and tell your editor, go find it yeah. over here, whereas it automatically finds the top level of project variant, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so you can do, uh, as we talked about, setting uh, in the current directory like a dot .vnv. And yeah, um, Python... VS Code, they'll, they'll pick it up because it is just a virtual environment at the end of the day. Nothing too special. So Got it. Yeah, it will work out of yeah. the box. Yeah, and Klutz out there in the audience has got us covered. Pip tools command is pip tool, pip compile, rebuild, output file, such and such, pyproject.txt from pyproject.toml. Yeah, cool. Nice. Yeah, and, and variations on that, I suspect. Um, so one thing that I was thinking about this that I expected Hatch to do, and maybe it does and maybe it doesn't, I just don't know, is suppose I want to use requests for Calci. Like Calci can't run locally. Uh -huh. It needs its calculator API service that it's going to connect to. So it needs a re request or HTTPX or something. Yeah. Uh, how would I, is there a way with Hatch to say, I have a new requirement, set that up, put it in the PyProject TOML, install it? And that currently, that, that's going to come with the, the Black File plugin. Um, mm -hmm. I, I figured um, it wouldn't make sense to add those commands until I knew how locking would work. Because sure. uh, adding and removing always hits the locking logic. And since there wasn't locking, uh, it didn't make sense to me to add those commands. 
Um, so right, yeah, yeah it's going to come soon. So right now you would just modify your pyproject.toml until those are added. Yeah. And then I think there's a way where um, Hatch looked at your pyproject.toml and said, okay, you're going to need these dependencies, right, when you run it? Um, in, in what sense? Uh, I, I thought it installed the dependencies. Oh, toml yeah. So pyproject.toml. Even if it won't edit it, like if I put something in there and I try to run it, it'll say, yeah. oh, I need this. Yeah, right. it'll sync it automatically. Yeah. Oh, oh, what command do I use to do that one? Um, either a run command or the so, shell command. Right. I see. Oh, even the shell will do it, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So if you do, um, if you, um, do you have to run pip list, for example? Yep. Okay. Now in pyproject.toml, add like requests maybe to okay. the dependencies. On. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, right again. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, okay, so see you. yeah, all right. Now I'll have requests and like friends and and requests. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah. Okay. That's pretty cool. Nice. And then I'm yeah. looking forward to the lock stuff because I absolutely love pip tools. I think it is a, a glorious <laughs> way. I yeah. used uh, for a while, I used um, Dependabot at GitHub and it drives me crazy. It's like so noisy. To I get like 30 PRs a week. I'm like, you know, could you just <laughs> package this up? And and so now I just start periodically. I just go, okay, I'm going to use pip tools and just ask, like, how has the world changed? And, and then update my stuff in a more a sane way yeah 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 that's um it was a bit noisy for us too at work so we have like a custom dependency update logic as well okay. i think there is an yeah. open feature request for a dependent bot to chunk the updates but i don't know if it has happened yeah yet. i think i've seen one of those for a couple of years and there was like a hundred yeah. plus one me too me too like i got to review these things <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And I, I don't know if it's there. It's not there on my my projects. It's still yeah. I'll get twenty. I'll do a, a pip uh, compile update, and I'll push that, and I'll get like twenty messages. These are no longer required. I'm like, okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Could you just batch them? You know. Anyway. Yeah. Um, okay. So so Calki is coming along here. Let's just imagine that it does good stuff. I haven't even written any code for it, but it depends upon requests. So that's a start. Um, the the next step, going kind of forking on the various possible definitions of what packaging is, a next step for this thing might be, I want to put it onto PyPI or create a wheel I can share. So mm -hmm. Hatch also supports that, right? Yeah. So first, uh, you have to create the uh, artifacts. So you would do Hatch build, and that would build my default, um, both the source distribution and the wheel. Yeah. Okay. So now if yeah. you um now in your current directory, uh just like the other tools, there's gonna to be a, a dist, uh D I S T yep. that um now has those. And if you run a hatch publish, that would put it on PyPI by default. And it would prompt you for your uh, username <laughs> and I'm not in that. Yeah. I don't want to own Calki on PyPI. No, just kidding. But yeah, I don't think I have it configured, so it wouldn't really do anything. But it would. It would go and put it on PyPI, right? Yeah, yeah. Potentially. Yeah. And that's yep. that's pretty straightforward. You also point out in the, the docs that um, CI build wheel and some and things like talks, they you know, you could be the build just hatchling could be the build system for that, right? Yeah, every yeah, can, like because hatch um, hatch does like a lot. So you can use you know, parts. Say you wanted to only use Environment management to replace like Tox or Nox, you could do that. If you wanted to only use Hatchling with like CI build wheel uh, or other tools, you could do that. If you wanted to only use the version management, you could do that. It's kind of choose whatever you want. Yeah, you're not locked okay. in. Yeah. 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 So the last thing I could do is publish, but I'm I'm not really gonna go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. There's also a way to set in the, the config file. You said that if I set into the config file under the publish index, disable true, well, you can make it confirm rather than just straight up publishing it, right? 
Yeah, that was a feature request. Yep. So yeah. yeah, cool. Another thing that is always I've always stumbled on when I do this, at least with Twine, is I'll have some project. I've done this. I published a version. Later, I'll come back to it. I'll make some changes. I'll increment the version. I used to have to do that manually, but now I can just do a hatch version. Um, and then, you know, I've been like, I'm not, I could build one again. Minor. Minor, yeah. yeah. There we go. It'll automatically change it. And that changes the code, which is great. So now if I do a hatch build, which is really nice, it'll create a new one. But if yeah. I look in my project, I've got the old one and the new one. And you can't republish the old one, I don't think. So what happens if I just say publish now and I've already got 0.1.0 .0 out there? Yeah, so you can do um, hatch build dash C for clean. And it should um, clean it first. Okay, that's cool. Because then um, I can just say hatch publish and not worry about conflicts. Yeah. Also, um, anything that exists already on PyPI, uh, it will ignore us. Um, it'll put a warning, but it, it won't fail the command. I oh, think Twine by yeah. default does fail. I think and it you have to pass well. the flag. So I do the inverse because that was frustrating to me too. So I, I do the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. Okay. Yeah. That's a, that's a really uh, cool aspect. And so, yeah, that was, uh, I guess, walking through through that um i think it was neat to just kind of explore it together so thanks for talking me through that yeah yeah and um yeah the past like month i've been pretty busy at work but i'm gonna pick up development again uh next week for hatch uh, mm -hmm. there's a bunch of open uh feature requests i have to <laughs> crank out so yeah this is a pretty popular project on github with 3.7 thousand stars so i suspect there's some user feedback Yep. Yep. And uh, so I guess the main next features are the lock file uh, plugin mechanism. And also people are asking about uh, workspaces, which is basically like kind of like editable installs, but more built in and fundamental. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to add that, uh, especially useful for mono repos. Um, oh, so, right. OK. Yeah. Because you you don't necessarily want to hatch build all of Google or or whatever, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so a workspace is uh, like a view into the mono repo that I said I I know there's like 500 projects here and they all have their things, but I want the web app and the data layer. <laughs> That's it. Something like right, that. right, exactly. Yeah. Okay. That yeah. sounds that sounds useful. Yeah, and I'm on my after uh, cargo. Uh, workspaces mm -hmm. in, in Rust. Um, I worked with that recently, and I think uh, they have pretty good uh, config and like a, a model of how local development works. So, okay, yeah, that sounds really yeah, good. My preview of what Hatch will look like it basically cargo <laughs> workspaces. <so. laughs> nice. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan out there says uh, that sounds like music to his ears. Definitely waiting on the workspaces feature for our mono repo work. Nice. Um, and then also Ryan is asking you, um, any chance there could be a package build target? I'm using PEX via Tox currently. Uh, yes, that's possible. Um, one thing that's great about plugins is I don't have to do every feature. Uh, anybody can do that. So we do have, if you go to the docs and yeah. go to the top, uh, plugins. Plugins. Or um, home. There. Yeah, plugins. Builder. Oh, Builder, yeah. Okay. And then Reference. Yep. And then, yeah, so no one third party. So here's some examples of third party Builder plugins. So the build command that you ran, it has an option to output a target, like a named target, other than wheel and sdist. So you can write an arbitrary Builder and build those targets. So yeah. OK, it's probably not super hard to do, I'm guessing, to just like basically bundle up the commands to build the pecs. Yep, and just implement oh, the interface, like that. and that's all you got to yeah. do. Yep. OK, yeah, excellent. Oh, good to hear. So I, I vote for uh, the lock file management, the dependency management. Uh, um, I'm excited to hear that that's coming. 
Yep, that's coming in next. Yep. Yeah. Have you can are you thinking of building on something like Pip Tools or doing your own? Um I I wouldn't feel confident doing my own um without feedback from like other folks that uh have been in this for longer. Like Brett Cannon. I think he mm -hmm. wrote the first Black File Pep attempt uh last year. For various reasons it got it can't Kind of got rejected, but I think his next attempt will happen. I just don't know when. So. All right. Excellent. Excellent. There's also a, a suggestion a Cython builder would be cool. Maybe a MyPy C. I don't know. There's a lot. That of one exists there. actually. Oh, the MyPy C one does. Okay. Yeah. If you go, back to, um, go back to um, go back to the plugins. Uh, I know the docs are a lot. Sorry. Back one. Build hook. Okay. And then reference. And it's oh, listed yeah. under third party. Hatch my Pisces. Also, I might say that one actually. Okay, nice. Actually, yeah. a black uh, builds with that now. Nice. Yeah. What about um, the Jupiter builder? What does that do? So recently, um, Jupiter switched their entire um, extension ecosystem to Hatchling actually. So now the standard way to do Jupyter stuff is with Hatchling, and that's the plugin that everything happens with. Nice. Okay, cool. Probably makes you feel good to see major projects like that using your tools. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm i happy that people are, like, you know, finding value in it, and, like, every time someone says, like, oh, it's so easy to use, it, yeah, it makes me happy. Yeah, indeed. I like stuff that can do a lot, but it's very simple. <laughs> That's my purpose. Yeah. Yeah, I think I might play with uh, the config, the global config, to see how close I can make it match my current workflow and make nice. it kind of coexist what I'm doing. So that'd be fun. Awesome. All right. Well, I think we're about out of time. Anything else you want to throw out there while we're talking about the project? Uh, no, just um. If anybody wants to, you know, contribute, um, there's lots of open issues. I have had lots of really nice contributors. Um, they almost finished adding type hinting everywhere. Like uh, in the beginning, it had zero type hinting, and then mm -hmm. a bunch of contributors helped out with that. Now it's almost fully uh, my pie. <laughs> so yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I saw you had forty contributors, so that's really cool. Yeah. Uh, maybe one other quick comment that I'd like to ask you about here is um, I see the domain this is on is hatch.pypa is in Python Packaging Authority dot io. Uh -huh. um, how to end up on pypa dot io versus you know hatch dot dev or whatever? Yeah, so this is just the standard domain for all the packages. So if you type in pip rather than hatch and get rid of the latest part, uh, it'll go right to the pip docs. Right, right, right. So well, when it was adopted, more about like, how did it become sort of official? Oh yeah, so um, yeah, you know I, mean? I announced Hatch 1.0, like the, the rewrite that happened uh, last year or sometime. Mm -hmm. And then the same day, maybe the next day, um, I forget who, but somebody in the Discord was asking if I wanted to join the PyPA um, and I was like, well, sure, that makes sense. So <laughs> then there was a vote on the mailing list, and it was unanimous that they agreed. And then after, I think, seven or ten days, then we transferred the repo, uh, and it was hosted on the new domain. So Right. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and it's also under the GitHub organization of IPA. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Excellent. All right, well, really nice project. Congrats on all the uptake and thanks. Yeah, it looks like people are enjoying it. So, two quick questions before you sure. get out of here. I didn't get to ask you this on the panel one because one, we're over time, and two, there was a bunch of people and I would have just been another 10 minute debate. Yeah. But uh, if you, first of all, notable PyPI package, something that you've come across, like, oh, this is super cool. People should know about package X. Anything come to mind? Um, I guess it's a bit cliche because. Right now, it's actually pretty popular, but 
I would still um, evangelize Textual. Textual mm -hmm. was like a new application for booting uh, TUIs, which is like Textual, um, not user interfaces. And I, I've actually been doing a project at work that uses this, and it's very nice. It's it's pretty awesome. It's it's kind of nuts what this thing does. Yeah, yeah. this base is like the the higher order UI framework built on Rich by Will McGugan and team, and you get like fly out docking panels and scrolling it's crazy. in. Yeah, yes, yeah. it's, it's like uh, kind of like if the web could be in a terminal. <laughs> true. Like that. It's yeah. true. I plan to actually use this for a hatch when I have time That's on the um, the creation, the interactive creation of a, a new project. Mm -hmm. On the left hand side, you would have like inputs, and then it would render the pi project dot time on the right hand side and mark oh, yeah. down. So. Okay. Oh, that's super cool. In a few months. Yeah. Yeah. Fun. Uh, and then if you're going to work on Hatch, what editor are you using these days? Uh, PyCharm. Um, I, I PyCharm for large projects. When I'm doing like one-off scripts, then VS Code. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, it's, this may be a question I got to start asking people. I don't know. Uh, PyCharm is, and all the, the JetBrains IDs, I believe, are starting to promote a what they call the, the new UI, which I think is more much more like VS Code. Uh, are, are you the the old school <laughs> style, or are you the the new UI style? I've I've not seen that yet, actually. There's a gear in the upper right. If you click on it, it'll say new UI. To me, I'm still I'm old school. I love the old one. I mean, I'm I'm using PyCharm, not VS Code, for a reason. So I don't want it to look more like VS Code and for my style, right? But I know other people prefer the opposite. So. Yeah, uh, I, anyway. I, I wouldn't mind using VS Code. There's one missing feature that is like a blocker where I just won't use VS Code full time, which is uh, it can't yet do vertical tabs. Uh, mm -hmm. There's an open feature for years, and I guess technically there's some kind of challenge to implementing that. So right now, if you have like 100 tabs, it doesn't look very nice. It's yeah, all horizontal. It's a bunch of X's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, I can't select them. I just close them. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Very cool. All right. Well, congrats with Hatch, and thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you very much. Nice you talking to you. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.